astronomy club that's uh, um, associated with the observatory. And I've been doing astroimaging for a very long time. Um, and we're going to do an introduction, which means I'm going to give you a list of things that you need to learn more about. And um, probably would be two weeks if I stood here and taught you everything that we're going to cover. But it's the things that you're going to have to learn more about um, in the future to improve your imaging. And also, we said at first, um, intro to CCD, but actually digital imaging is pretty much the same. That's, that's cool. yeah, I like I like this. Oh, I didn't know that's that. a brighter. Oh, okay, I got that's you. a brighter thing. Okay. So the uh, um, um, think DSLRs and CCD cameras. It's really the whole the same thing. Um, it's really a part of the same kind of stuff. And uh, as fascinating as I am to look at, the, the important stuff is up here on the screen. So. Uh, um, Let's start off with solar lunar planetary. And here we have a nice picture of the moon. Of course, I mainly went backwards. Okay. We have a nice picture of the moon here. And uh, um, versus deep sky imaging. And they're really two different things. And I'm going to be mostly talking about deep sky, although you'll be getting information about the other stuff. But what's the difference? Um, this uh, um, stuff like the moon. Okay, stuff like the uh, um, like the moon is really bright, and planets are really small. So the thing you're looking at is lots of power. You want to blow it up. You want to make it bigger so you can see detail. That's really a different sort of thing than uh, um, okay. I give up on this. That's really a different sort of thing than deep sky. Here's the Orion Nebula. Now we're talking about dim things in the night sky. They're not all that small, so you really don't need a lot of power, but what you need is a lot of sensitivity in your system to get these very dim things. Good rule of thumb, the dimmer it is, the farther away it is, and the more interesting it is. So um, it's really a two different disciplines. So I'm going to talk primarily about deep sky, and you're going to be getting other information. Um, good question. By the way, all the images here are were taken here at the Parnik Observatory, uh, primarily by members of KAS over the last 20 years or so. But uh, um, when I take pictures like this, what do you need? Um, you need a camera, the camera body. Um, you need some sort of optics, either a telescope or a telephoto lens. You need some sort of mount to hold it all. Um, and is it a tracking mount or is it just a tripod? Um, you can get away with a tripod, but tracking mount is probably something you should think about going to fairly soon. And how about a computer? Well, maybe. The, uh, with a CCD camera that we're going to talk about, you need a computer to control. The DSLR, you don't, but lots of people are going to controlling their DSLRs today with a computer. Um, one of the things, think of yourself in Binghamton, New York in February and you're up to here in snow. Do you really want to take your laptop out and drop it in the snowbank? So there, there may be some advantages to not using a computer. And right now the only way you can do that is with DSLR. But that's the components of what you need. And here's what you need. Um, well, yeah, we're talking about this thing over. Okay, optics. So we have a 20-inch telescope. So there's our optics. We have a camera. Back here we have an FLI CCD camera with a, uh, um, a seven-position filter wheel on it. And we have our mount down here. In this case, a tracking mount that's going to keep this thing pointed at the stars where we're taking pictures. And we're going to... Uh, um, we got computers to control all this stuff. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't afford this. I mean, we're, we're to, if you look at just the telescope, the re, what we're talking there, about a third of a million dollars replacement cost. And then you got to wrap this building around it, too. Um, so uh, we didn't pay that much, but um, that, that would be current replacement price. 
But you guys can get away with just this. A, a DSLR on a tripod or a uh, tracking mount. Let me show you a little bit about this tracking mount because it's kind of interesting. And there's something else here that's interesting also. Okay, the first thing is, see this black tube? Um, you point that at Polaris. That's all you have to do. There's a little telescope in there. You look through it, you get Polaris in the center, you're good to go. Inside this white thing, there's a, uh, a motor and some gears and a 9 volt battery. And you turn it on and it's now going to turn along this axis here. And it's going to follow the stores as you take your pictures with your DSLR. And one of the really neat things is this gizmo. It's called an intervalvometer. But if you're an antique person like me, you call it a cable release. That's old film talk, film speak. But what that allows you to do is tell the camera what to do. So um, last weekend, uh, Saturday night, Sunday night, when I was using a, a little bit better version of this um, down in uh, Pennsylvania, what I did was I said, take 30 second exposures, put five seconds between each one, and do it until I tell you to stop. And I walked away. Went and looked through other people's telescopes, uh, um, you know, had a Coke, uh, uh, look at the sky with binoculars, and it works. You leave it alone, the tracking motor tracks and follows the stars, this thing controls the DSLR, and you enjoy yourself. You can, if you're doing it at home, you can go inside and you know, search the internet or watch Wheel of Fortune reruns, or, you know, whatever is exciting. Can you do it on the DS on the tripod? Yes, you can. 30 seconds is probably too long. You're going to start to get some star trailing, but it will work. I highly recommend getting one of these. If you go to the Canon, go to you know Adorama or somewhere on the internet, and uh, they're going to charge you about 150 bucks for one of these. If you go to eBay or some of the other places, you can probably get one for 50 bucks. In my case, you guys all met Keith Workman last night. He sold me his for 25. So, you know, I mean, there are ways of getting this stuff uh, um, fairly cheap. Okay, now here's a more advanced setup, the sorts of things that you're going to see lots of amateur astronomers use today. And uh, um, the first thing I did when I saw this picture was say, this rig needs more wires. There's just not enough wires here. Well, no. I, there's enough wires, but okay. The, this added one additional thing to the equipment that I listed before, and that's a guide scope, and that's this thing right here. And uh, um, here's our mount, our tracking mount, and this is pointed at the North Star. And the motors in there are going to, uh, um, or going to make it follow the stars. And even more important, it's a go-to mount. That means the electronics in this hand controller it actually has a little computer in there. So once it's set up, I say, I want to see M42, the Orion Nebula. I plug the numbers in there, I push the button, and it moves right to it, and it's in the telescope. And that's really important if you have a CCD camera stuck on the end of it. But uh, um, what about wind? And what about astronomers with big feet, like my friend Roy, who come, walks by and kicks my telescope? Um, what about uh, um, um, gears? Problems with the gears in this uh, in this uh, mount. Um, these are not the most exotic things in the world, and they have some mechanical problems. So all of those things means that even though the tracking motors are following the sky, it's still going to move around a little bit. So back in the old days, what we used to do, really old days, back with George Washington, well, not that old, that old, but we would take a, um, a telescope and you'd look at a star and you have some lit red crosshairs and all night long you'd use buttons to keep that star in the crosshairs. Um, today we don't have to do that anymore. You get the little guide scope, you have a little camera on the side and you feed that into your computer and the computer keeps it on the stars for you all night long. So there's no problem with guiding, uh, um, um, what a guiding? You may need to use that, you may not, depends on how your equipment works. Uh, this guy obviously has it. Okay, one more thing is dew control. Um, I don't know where you guys live, but I live in Binghamton, New York. 
where on about a half, a quarter to a half nights, we get due and everything gets dewed up. Um, during the winter time, we call it frost, and everything gets frosted up. So you need to heat your optics a little bit to uh, um, keep them from doing up. And this guy, he has that on his telescope, and that's what this strap is up here, and that strap there. You may, if you're I'm looking through the scope, you may need some of this on your eyepieces, but that hooks into a little electric control box, and it provides a little bit of heat to the, uh, um, to the optics, and it keeps the dew and frost off. It's important, again, about half the nights or so. Huh? How many nights that I've been in the central Adirondacks, a beautiful night, and I get an hour's worth of images and I can't do anything more because everything frosts up. The, uh, um, the straps and a little control thing, you're talking about maybe 150 bucks. The cheap version, for those of us who don't, don't want to spend, spend $150, get yourself some rubber bands and those hand warmers that they sell in the, uh, um, in the uh, um, sporting goods stores, and you rubber band hand warmers on your, uh, um, on your stuff. Here. Uh, um, um, I, I would not advise this, but my friend Keith Workman, Keith who you met last night, occasionally just takes a hand warmer and throws it inside the, the front of his refractor. <laughs> I would not advise doing that, but he gets away with it. <laughs> well, oh. Now, all of this needs to be controlled with a laptop because we're using CCD cameras. And if you're a place like Cherry Springs where Roy and I were over the weekend and you got your laptop out, people are going to throw snowballs at you or kill you or whatever. So this particular person has this little tent and all you need is a box, a cardboard box or whatever. Cover the laptop up. It keeps the dew off it. It protects it. And the laptop is in here and it controls everything. The CCD cameras, the mount, the focuser, the electric focuser on here, the tracking gizmo, everything's from the mount. So if the owner of this thing, man, he really needs some more wires. But anyway, the owner of this thing um, will sit here in his little chair, look at his little laptop, control everything, and say, go to M42, be around that. He goes there, he starts the imaging run, and he walks away and goes bothers people with looking through um, telescopes and eyepieces and so on. Comes back in an hour or two and the image is done, hopefully. So you, you need, you, it takes a while to set something up like this, but once you do, it works fine. I won't talk too much about telescope designs. I don't have a lot of time to do it, but telescopes and lenses, I told you you need something like that. On these diagrams, a replace eyepiece with camera. You're going to stick your camera here for imaging. But you have refracting telescopes that use lenses. You have um, mirrored telescopes like this Newtonian that uses mirrors. You have combined telescopes, catadioptrics. Still not getting enough of a light here. I was lazy. Should have brought my own. Um, the uh, um, um, catadioptric. Um, but all you need to know as an imager is all these things do is they collect light and they bring the light to a focus in your eyepiece. Uh, every one of these telescope designs have some sort of problem with it that you as the imager has to know how to deal with your particular setup. Or when you're buying a thing, decide what system you want. If, uh, um, right. uh, if you, uh, um, um, we could sit here for the next two weeks and we could bring a bunch of experts or self-proclaimed ex experts like the KS members um, in here and we could argue about which is best and what we would find out is nobody would agree. Um, but as an imager, there are two, uh, two of the issues that you need to worry about is light gathering power and vignetting. Um, light gathering power. Remember I said we're, we're trying to image really dim stuff in the night sky? <laughs> well, we sometimes call these things light buckets. We're outside and we're trying to collect as much light as we can. Think of you standing outside in the rain with a funnel and you're trying to catch rainwater. The bigger you make that funnel, 
the more rain that you're going to collect and the more light that's going to come out of the, uh, um, um, the more water is going to come out of the spout. The bigger that you make the telescope, the more light you're going to collect and the brighter things are going to be in your eyepiece or your camera, on your camera detector. That's why astronomers always went bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes to collect more light so they can see, uh, um, they can see dimmer things. Big netting. Um, if we took a picture of a snowstorm or we put, took a picture of a bed sheet hanging up in the sun, we should get an evenly illuminated picture, sort of like that. Should be just white, white, flat white. We're not going to get that. None of these optics will produce that. It's a problem with the optics itself. It produces what's called vignetting. Light falls off in the corners. And unless you want pictures that are screwed up, you're going to have to deal with, with, uh, with that. We'll mention. Okay, tracking mounts. And we have a little version of one over here. Maybe we can take a look at it in a minute. But here's a picture where somebody just left a camera on a tripod open for a couple of hours, pointed at the North Star. And guess what? We get trailing. So you're going to have all of these. Uh, um, you're going to have all these um, star trails around here. Now I'm getting there. We go. You got all these star trails around here. Um, the North Star isn't quite at the North Celestial Pole, so it's going to go around a little circle too, and you need to adjust for that. Or you're going to have, uh, um, or you're going to have trailing in your images, and so you need a tracking mount. And we have the tracking mount here, that's uh, um, that's again pointed at the North Star, and it's this axis right there. You need to make that as parallel to the Earth's axis as you can get it. And then the motor in here will make the mount turn. Well, if you out in the observatory and you watch the 20 inch for a couple of hours, it moves. And it would actually go around once in 24 hours if we let it go. Um, but it's not moving. We're moving. Right now, we're all going like 800 miles an hour in that direction, towards the east, because we're sitting on a turning earth. So what the motor is actually doing is keeping the telescope or your camera steady while we're turning. But an uh, um, interesting way to, to think about things. But okay, so you need some sort of tracking mount. Um, this might explain it a little bit better. Uh, here we are in the here we are sitting in Binghamton, and we're on the turning Earth, and the Earth is moving counterclockwise this way. And the motor is making the telescope move exactly the opposite direction, um, um, counterclockwise, uh, again, so the stars don't move. And here's an example of a couple of different kinds of tracking mounts that, uh, um, that, that are doing that. Just so you know. Okay, let's talk about digital single X single lens reflex mounts, the DSLR, versus the astronomy related CCD camera, uh, one versus the other. And when I grabbed these pictures, I was really happy to, uh, um, to grab this one, an advertisement. The, the nice thing about it is no, this thing has its lens off, but it's got this filter stuck in it. I, I just bought one of these. They're, they're pretty expensive. They're about 200 bucks. But the thing they do is they help you tremendously with light pollution. That filter lets through all of the starlight and eliminates all the light in the sky from, uh, um, from street lights. And it really works. I mean, it's not a 100% solution. You're still better off getting out to somewhere that's really dark, like the Catskills or the Adirondacks or northern Pennsylvania or whatever. Even here at Copernic is better than nothing. But my short-term experience with the thing is that it actually works. A couple of times I used it at my house. Um, so I, I mean, it's a, a good next step if you're stuck in Brooklyn, New York, or something like that to do your imaging. Um, you can really do it from there. The uh, CCD camera looks like this. These are made by the Santa Barbara Inter um, Imaging Group, SBIG. And, uh, um, 
that's uh, their current model that they have available. And it, uh, um, notice there's no buttons, there's no off and on switch, there's nothing else. You need a computer to control this thing. And let's compare the two. Okay, let's look at the DSLR first. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but this is certainly important to me. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about money in a minute, but uh, um, and used is better. Uh, used stuff works, and it may only net, and it's almost as good as the, as the latest stuff, and you can save yourself a bunch of money. Um, if you get yourself a DSLR, you can take selfies, you can take pictures of your family members, take pictures of your neighbors taking out the garbage and so on. So that's another advantage of this thing. You buy one of these and you're no longer interested in astronomy, you still have a great camera. Um, we talked about this, no need for a PC in the field. So again, that's really nice if you're up to your waist in snow. Um, or the grass is wet, or uh, you don't want to drop your expensive PC in the dark. People are starting to use PCs to control these because there are certain advantages to do that. Okay, well, everything, for every pro, there's a bunch of cons, so let's talk about some of the not-so-happy things about this. It's less sensitive. That's the big one. And remember that we were talking about, uh, um, we're trying to image dim stuff. So sensitivity is really important. Um, it's not cooled. Uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. It has problems with red nebulas, it has more noise, and ultimately once you get into this, it's not, people will tell you they're easier to use and recommend you start with them, but they're not. Once you're doing intermediate level imaging and beyond, they're not any easier to use. It's just as complicated. In fact, in some ways it's more complicated. Okay, what about the red nebula? Uh, the lenses that go on these things, that you're all familiar with, they're designed for visual light that you see with your eyeballs. Um, unfortunately, the chip in there just loves infrared light, heat, heat energy. It just loves that stuff, and the lenses are not designed to handle it. So if you just took pictures with that a regular lens and just a chip, you're going to get fuzzy pictures. So what they do is Canon and Nikon and the people who made your, uh, um, your cell phone and so on, they put a filter, not this one, but another filter inside that filters out infrared. Unfortunately, also filters out very deep red colors. And that's exactly where all the nebulas are that we, want to, that we astronomers want to take pictures of. So some people solve that, I have at least one friend who has, by paying a lot of money to have them to pull the filter out, and then you have a camera that you've just, you no longer have a warranty for. You do that and Canon's not going to fix it for you. So you have a $1,200 camera with no warranty, and uh, also you need special filters to take normal pictures or everything's going to look really red. So that's the, uh, um, the red filter problem, and let's talk about cool. Uh, one thing you're going to hear tomorrow, and I maybe some more information about, it, but um, the way these chips work is as light hits the chip, it knocks electrons out of the atoms that are in the chip. And those electrons build up as an electrical charge in the chip. And then we read that out. Unfortunately, so does heat. And if you grab some hot coffee out there, or touch the thing, and you burn yourself, what's really going on? Well, all those atoms in there are they're running around. They're kind of beating against each other, and the faster they run, and the more they clunk into each other, and the longer the distance they do, the more vibration you get, the hotter the thing is. That's what heat is. It's the vibration of atoms in solids and liquids and gases. And the more vibration, well guess what? That vibration also knocks electrons out in our chip. And we're looking at stuff that's so dim that the, uh, um, that the uh, heat itself is knocking electrons out. So we need to cool the chip and you, you, don't, you can't do that with these cameras. Um, 
So what, what we do with, with CCD cameras is we actually have a little cooler in there and our chips outside in the observatory, we using air cooling, we run down to about 30 degrees below freezing. Um, at major observatories, they, lose, they use liquid nitrogen to go down to almost absolute zero. We don't want to fool around with that stuff because it's pretty dangerous here, so we don't here. But that's another problem with DSLRs is they're not cool. Um, and talk about that. Okay. So what about our Astro CCD camera? It has a bigger chip, which gives you more sky. It also has a more sensitive chip that will allow you to take pictures faster and see dimmer stuff. Very important in deep sky imaging. And has less noise. And what do I mean by noise? Well, a salt and pepper speckle that you'll see in some of these pictures, that's the noise that's being created. And it's also cooled. Again, less noise. And the cooling, the computer controls the cooling plus or minus a tenth of a degree. So the cooling is very accurate. And that's important when we're trying to do science with it. Um, the camera is under complete PC control. So you're not stuck with what Canon gives you. You can actually do whatever you want with it by you know, running it with the software and running the camera the way you want, not the way Canon tells you have to do. And you use the same computer, by the way, to control the focus on the telescope and to control the way the mount is working. So you have one PC running one program that's controlling everything with a uh, um, um, with this kind of camera. People are now starting to do that with DSLRs. Uh, here's the big baddie for you guys, for me too. They're really expensive, um, and this is not a problem for me because I have all the time in the world. Could be a problem for you. Is it takes more time to learn how to use this kind of equipment. Um, on the expensive side, again, used, you can save a bunch of money. A camera like that, as it sits, is about $7,000. I just bought the older version, previous version of it, that was also sold new for $7,000. I paid $2,000. So you can save yourself a bunch of money, and smaller, less powerful CCD cameras you can get for substantially less money than that as long as you're willing to do used, and this stuff works pretty good. Not the latest stuff, but you'll still make good pictures, and you'll still get good pictures of it. Um, when we're talking about CCD camera, I want one other thing that this stuff, we're very lucky in astronomy that we can get that, um, because how many astronomers there are? Not many. We don't have a room full of people here, we have just you guys. Um, so, the, you, they wouldn't even sell these things to just astronomers, but about 70 to 80 percent of these cameras are actually used in biomedical research. So, we get the, the biology students coming here from Binghamton University, and they know all about this equipment and how to use it. They don't know nothing about astronomy, but they know how to use the equipment because they're, they use it in biology. So that 80% of these things get set and get, end up in biomedical research. Um, color versus mono camera with CCD cameras. Okay, th this is just a drawing here of a CCD chip, a schematic of what it looks like. And each one of these things are called pixels or picture elements. And these are the things that actually collect the light and have the electrons in there. And guess what? They're all black and white. So how do you get color out of them? Well, the way they get color out of them in your cell phone and your DSLR and, uh, um, and your video camera or any other camera is 90% of those are have these color filters. This is all microscopic, by the way. They have these color filters over the top of it. So, you have blue filters, let's just the blue light through, and lights up just those pixels. You have reds that light up just these pixels. And then you have greens. Notice there's a lot more green than the other two, and that, that's actually a problem. Um, the, the other thing here is, if we did a mono camera, each one of these things would be one dot on your display screen. One pixel, one dot. Here with 
the color, one dot, it is in color, but it's all four of these pixels. Two greens, a red, and a blue, and that gives you one dot. So what does that mean? That means that my picture covers, you have a lot more resolution, you can see a lot more detail in the mono camera because the pixels are smaller and give you more resolution. So there are certain advantages to why you would want to use one versus the other. And this is another one of those things where we could have 15 self-proclaimed experts in here and half of us would say get color and the other half would say get mono and both work. Um, let's, I got all this information off our friends right here in Binghamton, New York. Finger Lakes Instrumentation that makes these cameras and uh, um, this type of camera. And here's what they say on their website. Um, and that they'll sell you anything. You show up with a pile of money, they'll sell you whatever you want. And they'll be very happy. Um, but if you ask them, well, what do I really need? This is what they tell you. For scientific applications where we're going to be getting scientific data, that's just pretty pictures. We want a monochrome CCD, black and white, and then we want to use color filters in front of it. We're going to have full-size round red, blue, green, and other types of color filters that we put in front of the camera, and we have to take a red picture, a blue picture, a green picture, and put them together in the camera to get uh, colors. And one of the reasons we want that is you buy a, a DSLR, or you buy a color picture, you're stuck with what the maker gives you. You buy a monochrome, you pick the, you pick the filters used. You decide what's going to, you have greater control over the images and what you're going to get and what you're going to get out of it. And also, yes, a color CCD will give you a color image in one shot rather than have to take three or four shots. But they also compromise resolution. What does that mean? That means you don't see the fine detail in the image. You lose the fine detail. It goes away. So my person, what I've always used is the mono CCD cameras, the black and whites with the uh, color filters and the filter wheel that puts them um, in front of the machine. I have friends who take really beautiful pictures with color full color set and they think they're doing the better deal and you're just going to have to either live with whatever you buy because it's cheap or uh, um, or uh, um, decide on your own what you want to do. Okay, we are now going to cover the history of astronomy in the next 30 seconds um, versus a whole um, um, a week or two. Um, in the late 19th century, back when I was born, back when um, Nicholas Skydock was born. No, no, no we, we weren't that born in the 1890s. But it was a long, it was a long time ago. I was born before then. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, 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 we've been around for a while. That's why we know all this stuff. Yeah, they invented photography with um, film, and they invented the spectrograph, which is a thing that takes starlight and spreads it out into all its colors. And um, you can determine a whole bunch of, of astronomy from that. And a spectrograph allows you to record and film or what, whatever uh, the spectrum. And then you can do a lot of science with that. And that changed what we used to call astronomy into what we now call astrophysics. We didn't just tell people what we saw in the sky. We could now begin to tell them what it actually was. And uh, um, then we, uh, um, one important thing, and you'll hear me talk about this tomorrow night also, is astronomy is an observational science. If a science works, you have a theory. You compare the theory to what you actually get. And the best way to do that is with running experiments. And you probably did some experiments at school and learned how that works. Unfortunately, in astronomy, we can't take a star or a nebula and grind it up and put it in a test tube or run an electric current through it. So we can't do in astronomy. We can't do experiments. We can only do observations. So we take our theory 
and we compare it to what we observe, and if what we what we observe is what the theory says we should see, there's one check mark supporting the theory. Doesn't mean it's right, but it's one piece of evidence towards it. If we see something different, that's one X mark for the theory. Doesn't mean the theory is wrong. Kind of leads you to uh, um, uh oh, I got to do some more observation. Um, by the late 20th century, when you guys were born, um, you, we had electronic detectors, which we're talking about right now. And that allowed us to look beyond just the visual stuff that we can see with our eyeballs. And we looked in infrared, we looked in radio waves, we looked in ultraviolet, we looked in x-rays, even in gamma rays, a lot of the stuff you need to be in space. That really expanded what we know about astronomy. There's a great leap forward. Okay, that's in 30 seconds what really you need to read a whole book about. But, um, and why did they mention all that? Because in 1975, professional astronomers, that's the people who get paid, um, and uh, have PhDs and so on, they started to switch from film to the electronic camera based on the CCD. And here's a piece of trivia that you really don't need to know at all. CCD stands for charge couple device. And I showed you a little bit before. Here's commercial stuff from the mid-1990s. There's the camera. Here's a tracking camera on the side that's doing some tracking. But this is like really old stuff now. You could probably buy one of these for 50 bucks. So actually, somebody might even give you one. Um, that's how uh, um, primitive it is. This is just a drawing of what the chip looks like, and we have all these pixel things in here. And again, remember I said that the light hits each of the pixels, and it knocks electrons off in there, and these just hold charge, and they build up electric charge, and as long as the light keeps hitting it, it keeps building up electric charge, we close the shutter, then we read the charge out. We've been talking digital. These are not digital devices. They're analog devices. Yeah, like 1930s radio, and that's exactly what it is. It gets digital later on. Um, maybe we might get to a little bit. Okay. How about a CMOS chip? We just talked about CCD chip. A CMOS chip is, again, deadly facts that you don't really need to know. Uh, I just put it here in case somebody asks me. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. I mean, yeah, we, what you need to know is that a CCD chip is far more sensitive to light, but it's really slow to read out. Um, it takes a long time to read out, and that's not good if you got your cell phone, you want to take a selfie. You don't want to wait two minutes to get your picture out. You want to get it right away. Or if you got a video camera or a DSLR, even worse. So CMOS is really, really popular with your cell phones and your and your digital cameras and your video cameras and so on. And they don't need sensitivity because they're using it in bright daylight. Who, who needs sensitivity? We're, we need sensitivity and we don't care how long it takes to download and get the data out. So we're happier with CCD. And here's a modern, here's what they actually look like. This is a modern SBIG camera taken apart. Somebody's pulled it apart. So there's the there's the, the CCD chip itself. It's got all these wires that hook it into the uh, into the electronics of the camera. Here's another CCD chip. What's that for? S big specialty puts a little guide a second guiding chip in here. So this thing is going to look for the star and whether it moves or not. It's going to move your telescope depending on the star. But this is the guy that takes the picture. This physically, how big is it? It's bigger than 35 millimeter film, and I know you guys have never seen film, so you know how big 35 millimeter is. But it's a, that's a fairly big chip. How about yeah, big. and it will give you lots of sky when you put it on your telescope, and that's that's what they look like. Now th this is going to be covered with a piece of glass, and then that piece, of, and then the air is going to be sucked out in here, and and keep it nice and dry so it doesn't do up. And there's a cooler on the back of it that's going to bring it down 30, 40 degrees cooler than, than 
the regular temperature. And that's what's built in there. But what about these CCDs? How do they work? Okay, we got light building up in all these pixels that's going to give us our image, and guess what? We can read one pixel. One pixel. I don't care, you got 10 megapixel, 16 megapixel CCD, we can read one. Just one. And this is the way it works. Uh, here we have rain going into cups. Think light photons going into these pixels. Same thing. We read the one out. And we put it in the gauge. We put it in the gauge and we get a, and we look at the gauge and we get a number. And we have a number that tells us how bright the pixel should be. Then we, um, the electronics makes all of these things dumped down the line and we dump another one out and we dump another one out. When we get the whole line done, then we move, shift them all over and we do the other one. That's why it takes so long because we're reading the pixels out one at a time and we have to convert them into numbers. That's called an analog to digital converter. What I don't show in here is these charges are so small, so tiny, we have to run them through an amplifier. Um, that's like 1950s stuff, like the transistor radio that I had when I was a kid. And uh, um, Dr. Gaidosh, who's an electronics wizard, will be glad to tell you that old-fashioned um, amplifiers have distortion. So there's more noise that you're getting out of the thing. Um, so what about the CMOS chip that we talked about? Well, that, had, that reads all the pixels out in one shot. It needs a more sophisticated electronics here, but it gets it all out in one shot, and but why don't we like it? Well, in order to do that, they need a whole bunch of wires over the top of the chip to, get, to read them all out in one shot, and those wires get in the way. They block the light from hitting the chip, and that's why a CCD chip is 10 times or more, more sensitive than a, uh, um, a CMOS chip. So, we astronomers use CCD. The bad news is, um, the people that make this stuff don't want to fool around with CCD anymore, and all the engineers are working on CMOS. Sony, who's a big maker of CCD chips, are not going to make them anymore. They promised to make a 10-year supply and put them in a warehouse for we astronomers, but if they don't get the CMOS chips up to speed in the next few years, we're all in big trouble. So if you want a CCD camera, you better buy it soon, because you may not be able to get one. But hopefully CMOS will catch up and be doing better. But that's some of the things that you need to know. Okay. Until the chip is read, each picture and each picture is digitized. That means we convert it into another. That's another thing. When we read this gauge with the analog to digital converter, it makes mistakes on, on reading this. So it has, needs to um, basically round the numbers off. And you all know how to round numbers. The analog to digital converter chip need, needs to know how to do that also. And the way the rest of the world works, the more money you spend, the better it works. So uh, um, you spend more money, you get less errors. Okay. This is an interesting graph that might be too much to understand, but let's just talk about it. Wavelength of light means color of light. Uh, here's the visual band that we can see. Everything, Roy G. Biv stuff. And uh, um, quantum efficiency, forget what that means. It's just how many of those little photons of light do we catch? And for you math wizards, notice this is a logometric scale. For you non-math wizards, just notice it's a tenth of a percent, one percent, ten percent, a hundred percent. Okay, here's your eyeballs. And um, right now, there's a whole bunch, just billions of photons hitting the retina in your eye right now. And your brain is recording that. And you record best in, in yellow and green. Why? We live on the Earth. Um, we live under a star called the sun that produces most of its light in yellow and green, guess what? Our eyes work there. Our eyes are designed to work under that. And it falls off a lot in red and blue. And 1%, what's wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. I mean, like we give you like all these billions of photons 
and 99 out of every 100, you don't even see. You don't report them. They go right through your eyeball, and you don't see anything. At least with cats, they have a reflector in the back, and they get two choices. The light gets reflected back through their retina a second time, and they're up like at 2 or 3%. But that's not very good, and that's why stuff looks really dim when you look, and unimpressive when you look through a telescope. Okay, photographic plate. Okay, the old pho photographic stuff. Notice it falls off a lot in the red. It gets into the infrared out in here, but it falls off a lot. Does really good in in blue and ultraviolet, um, which back when we used a lot of film, all of our telescopes, particularly the refractors, were designed to work in UV, but it's still only one percent. Really nice in here and in here, but in the middle, it's not much better than your eye. But still, you can do a lot with photography. Viticon, and what the hell's that? Okay, you guys don't remember this, but some of us in the room remember these huge TV cameras oh, yeah. that they used to have on uh, big dollies to put them or push them around. That's old-fashioned technology from the late 1930s, and TV stations started about 1950 or so. And that's what they used that stuff right up until the late 70s. And we actually use some of those during burning. But old-fashioned video would work up, wow, 10%. It, it still loses, it's one out of one out of 10 photons, the other nine it loses. And uh, um, it doesn't work very well in the red. Works real good over here in ultraviolet, but um, that's still, that's way better than photography, but there are other issues with it. Okay, CCD, here it is. A special expensive type of CD, CCD, 100%. It, unlike you and your inefficient eyeballs, it captures almost every photon that hits it. And it really, really, really loves infrared. It loves way over, it doesn't work too good in ultraviolet. Works some, but doesn't work too good in ultraviolet. But it really, really, really loves infrared. 100% versus you, you ineffective people at 1% down here. So. With a CCD camera, you're going to collect a lot more light. You're going to be a lot more efficient. And uh, one time I was here and had a bunch of Boy Scouts. And they said, we want to look through the telescope. And I was showing them CCD images. And I said, OK, look. And after about three minutes of looking, they said, could you put the camera back on again? Because you can see so much more with the camera than you can see with your eyeball. Uh, more efficient than any other detector, CCD. Uh, again, did I mention that the they're not making them anymore, so got some problems. Okay, here's some of the problems we had. I talked about vignetting, the light file fall off. This is basic image processing. Do you have to do this with your tripod shots with the DSLR? Yes, you do. If you want to get as best um, images out of it as you can possibly um, can. Um, here is a picture of a snowstorm or it's a picture of a white sheet in the daytime, or it's a picture of the inside of our dome, or it's a picture of the, um, or the twilight sky, and the lights fall off in the corners. And it should look like this, but it doesn't. This is the vignetting that's, uh, um, that's part of your optical system, and you as imagers have to adjust for that. And uh, um, notice there's some other junk in here that we'll talk about in a minute. So let's say this is right, 100% brightness, and this is like 80% brightness over here. Well, if, remember the, the computer, this is all just a pile of numbers. If you divide these numbers into your picture, the, the, the image that you've taken with the camera, it will make it 80, it'll bring that 20% up. So you take the flat fields and you take these numbers and divide them into your actual image. It adjusts for all of that error. It goes away, assuming you did it right. Flat fields, you can read entire books on how to do it, and it's still a problem. But you, you, you need to do flat fields. And one way you can do this with your DSLR, just take a white handkerchief and put it over the camera. Take a bunch of, uh, of uh, um, shots of the daytime sky with a white um, handkerchief over your camera. Remember I mentioned about dark, about 
the heat causing images, uh, causing electrons to build up? Here's a picture taken with a shutter closed. And I got all this um, salt and pepper stuff in here. That's all of the electrons and current being caused by just the heat in the chip. So what I need to do is subtract this from my, my DSLR shot or my CCD shot, every one of them, and a bias frame, um, this is what's wrong with your CCD chip. Uh, every one of these things, bi bias is an, an electronic term, and it just means that the, the camera keeps an electric charge across the chip all the time. And um, a, normally it would be about 100 counts out of 64,000 in the CCD camera. It's not much, but this salt and pepper stuff and these streaks, that's the, that's the errors built into your chip. That is, um, that's what's wrong with it. It's not perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. So you need to subtract this. And how do you take bias frames? The fastest exposure you can with the camera covered, that's a bias frame. And you need to subtract that. So what do I do to process? I take a picture of the sky with my DSLR, and then I subtract the dark frame, I subtract the, dark, the bias frame, and I divide by the flat frame. Or I have the software that does it, and I say, push the button, and it does it for you automatically. So you really don't need to do all this. You just need to know what's going on so you understand why. So it removes the effects created by the camera and the scope. Um, optical problems, thermal problems, and electronic problems. And doing this, applying these frames, is called producing a calibrated image file. Wow. OK, here's a actual, wow, real Copernic dark frame from our new CCD camera out of the 20 inch that we're going to go take a look at in a minute. In a minute. And You'll see salt and pepper. It looks worse if you get up here. And you'll see some bright pixels in here. And that's just problems with the chip. This is a $12,000 camera and it's got problems. Yep. There's no, nothing perfect. And uh, um, there are some black ones in here also. To, to get rid of some of this, we don't use one dark frame. We take about 50 of them and we average them together. And that's the dark frame, that average, average of 50 dark frames. That's the one that we use to uh, um, subtract from our picture files. And if we're taking two-minute pictures, we have to take two-minute dark frames. And uh, um, if we're going to take, and they got to be at the same temperature. So when you guys are watching TV on cloudy nights, Georgie is up here in the observatory taking dark frames, taking pictures of, with the shutter. Um, here's a flat frame, and again, I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to investigate that. But notice a little bit of light fall off, um, and even though we have a very big ship and we have a very big, very expensive telescope. Get a little bit of light fall off, and anybody hungry? All these donuts. Um, what the hell's that? Okay, I'm the people who put the my, my good friends. Um, who put the telescope on the camera forgot to clean the chip and forgot to clean the filters. So they left little dust specks on there. So if you look at the thing and use a flashlight, you're going to see these tiny little spots, dust specks. They should have cleaned them off, but they didn't. And there are some distance from the chip, so they make this shadow. The du each dust speck makes this little circular shadow. There's some big ones. These are from the filters. And this is from the cover, cover glass in front of the chip. And uh, um, so they're in our, our real pictures. We take a picture and that's, and that's actually there. It's not much. This is only maybe a 2 or 3% drop. But if we take our actual picture, pile of numbers in the, in the picture, and we divide by this pile of numbers in the flat frame, guess what? All of this goes away in the image. So I've adjusted away from it. Again, we need about 20 of these, and we average them to help beat down the noise. And the other thing is we need one for every filter. We have seven filters. So it's a lot of time that, that you need. So what about your DSLR? What you need with a DSLR is, number one, keep your camera clean. And number two, 
if I were last weekend when I was up at when I was out at Pennsylvania taking um, DSLR shots of the night sky, I just took the dark from. And the flats, I have some old ones that I may use, but you can you can ignore this stuff, but the more of it you do, the better your pictures are going to be. Um, advanced image processing, which is the next class that we're going to give here. Well, actually, we don't have it scheduled, but if we have one, you get to an, you get to an advanced version, um, you're going to do this kind of stuff. You're going to process to remove noise, and you're going to adjust the image to show more and more details in the image. So where's my noise coming from? Told you about how the camera, no matter how expensive it is, is going to have errors in it from amplifiers and dirt and so on. Too short of exposure. That's a big problem here in Binghamton. Did I, did I mention we live in Binghamton? And we're the second cloudiest city in North America. So we have a lot of problems with clouds cutting our exposure short. So. Uh, um, we can do something to remove some of that noise from having too short exposure. Uh, poor seeing. What's that? The air, air turbulence. You got a lot of uh, motion in the air and so on. Air turbulence. Um, that uh, um, that seeing problem, we can adjust for that. Um, bright sky background from light pollution. We can adjust for that. How about my telescope tracking mount uh, um, that performing well? I can adjust for that. I'm not gonna, you're not going to learn how to do that here, but let me give you an example. This is old stuff. This is like from 10, 12 years ago. But uh, um, here's a single 60-second shot with an old antique CCD camera, and the dark has been subtracted from it already. There is no flat field. Um, it's noisy from too short of exposure and short seeing. And, um, uh, Fifteen years ago, this would be world-class um, imaging. Today, most people would consider it kind of junky, but uh, um, a globular star cluster. Okay, here you can the flat field from the time, and you can see some of those dust donuts, and that's a defect in the chip. And I took four of those 60-second shots, the four best ones, I threw the bad ones away, and I, av I added them together. And I applied the flat field, and now I still need more processing. Uh, um, I applied a deconvolution. That's a fancy term for getting rid of the seeing error and making the stars tighter. And uh, um, I also did the color processing by taking the three different types, red, blue, green colors, and putting them together and producing a, a color image. And this would be an excellent image 15 years ago. And today you would be doing something a lot better than that. But uh, um, we're not going to teach you how to do that advanced processing. You're going to need to take another class or read a book or something to uh, figure out how to do that. But I just wanted to give you an introduction of what happened. Okay. Here's what Copernic looked like when it first started. This is back in the old days. Um, here we have the aliens and their flying saucers delivering all the stuff here. Um, here we have Nicholas, who was originally a Bigfoot Sasquatch, <laughs> and now we dress him up and he's a staff member. And uh, um, all that stuff you heard about the Copernic Society, Bill and Ben, none of that's true. This is, uh, this, this is where it all came from. Uh, um, You've been watching the History Channel. You, you're the first people to do it. You're the first people to do it. Okay, everybody who's asleep can now continue to go to sleep or 